Welcome, everybody. And we're going to be talking today about continuous delivery and the cloud. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I have Nigel here with me in the, in the best ThoughtWorks style. We're going to be pairing in this presentation. So let's get started. Um, if you don't know ThoughtWorks, we are all over the world, and more specifically, myself and Nigel, we are speaking here from down under in sunny Melbourne. Uh, I don't know exactly where you are in the world, but hopefully you're gonna be close to one of our offices. Each one of these dots is one of them. So feel free to look in thoughtworks.com, and if you need to contact us, um, yeah, you're welcome to at any time. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Aragao again, and I am a project manager with ThoughtWorks. I've been uh, with this company for the last five years, and I've done a lot of development as well. Uh, and continuous delivery has been something that has been really important to me and a lot of clients that I've been working with over the last 12 months. If you want to get in contact, feel free to send me an email. The questions should be directed uh, to Rebecca today, and we're going to answer them as many as we can in the end of the session. But after that, if you still have any other pending questions or if we didn't have enough time to go through all of them, feel free to contact me. Also, my social network of preference is LinkedIn, so you can check out my profile and also get in contact through there. I'm going to let Nigel now introduce himself. Hi, everybody. My name is Nigel. I work with ThoughtWorks primarily as a developer. But um, in the last few years, I've worn many hats. I've been a developer. I've been um, a program manager. I've been a QA. I've even been a system administrator. And what I really like to do is bring all those experiences together and my common role in most clients I go to is to try and bridge the gap between development and operations and really be a part of this movement that people talk about, the DevOps movement. Um, my email address is up on the screen there. Uh, do feel free to drop me a line if you have any questions about the presentation after this. Um, there's also my GitHub URL there. Um, it's got all my develop activity, including some sample code uh, for part of this presentation. Cool. So let's get started. So our agenda for today is mainly two key things that we're going to address. One is impediments to continuous delivery. So what are the things that typically hinder teams when they are trying to achieve continuous delivery? And then we're going to propose a three-step strategy to overcome those impediments, and they actually become evident or facilitated through cloud technologies. And then we're going to do a quick summary on that, and we will open for questions. Uh, I think it's important to uh, mention here that we do expect uh, a level of comfort with uh, continuous delivery as a subject and also uh, software development in general. As a matter of fact, this webinar is really not going to cover any of the continuous delivery 101 because this presentation is the 10th one in the series of 12 that we've been putting together over the last 10 months or so. So if you need to recap or if you're not familiar with the concepts, please check out the other webinars or check out our continuous delivery book and make sure you're familiarized with the concepts, but we're not going to be covering them in detail today. Uh, also, we're not going to be focusing too much on tools and vendors. Uh, we will mention occasionally, occasionally what you can use to solve a problem uh, and things that we have used with our clients, but we're not going to be focusing on any of them in, in, in specific. Also, uh, we're not going to be showing actual code. So if you're really keen on seeing how to do things, uh, I do recommend anyway that you stick around. There is a reference in the end uh, to a simple project that Nigel put together for a, a summit that we had here in Australia, and it represents exactly what we're proposing here today. So it will at least enable you to kickstart and uh, be able to have a reference on how to do that. But again, there's not going to be any code being presented today. 
So implementing continuous delivery. Continuous delivery as a subject uh, is quite attractive and appealing to most people that I speak with in IT environments because they really want to achieve fast continuous delivery to, app, to production. However, this is something that's quite difficult to be achieved. There are a lot of impediments and a lot of things that make hard for teams to be able to implement continuous delivery properly. So it, it's a very attractive subject, however, it's quite tricky to, to get it done properly. But when we mean continuous delivery, what exactly are we talking about? So Jess Humble defines it as a fast automated way of knowing whether your application is ready to go to production every time there is a change. And when we're saying change in this context, it's not necessarily just uh, application code, but everything else that surrounds it, either infrastructure, configuration, database, patching, so on and so forth. So the idea is that every time that a change is introduced, you should be able to know immediately whether you can push that change to production or not, or if it's going to break something. So in order to define um, production readiness, you need first to, ass to assess what is your path to production. So typically, how do companies uh, handle pushing changes all the way across multiple environments to production? So this is actually a, a high level identification of the parts of the process. We're not necessarily uh, going to talk it as a pipeline or a particular way of addressing it, but that's what we typically see in clients uh, that do in-house software development and the phases that they go through to, to make those changes arrive in production. So uh, as a first step, what typically people have, uh, most companies that we arrive at, they will have multiple machines that represent environments. So they will have machines acting as different roles. So for instance, they could have a test environment where developers will uh, check whether their changes that they made in the code base works fine. Uh, a UAT, a user acceptance test environment where business or beta testers will try out the application and see if it performs as designed. And finally, production. So all these environments, they are typically provisioned ahead of time. They, they already exist, and by provisioning here in this context, I mean someone has picked up the tin, the box, installed an operating system, configured everything that it needs so uh, development teams and users can uh, check the application. Notice that there's a little hand in there in the corner. That's the, the hand of fear when people do things manually and they tweak uh, without a lot of control. And we're going to see that that's one of the key problems. You, you probably know that already, and you, you might have uh, felt that hand of fear lingering over your systems. But anyway, the, the key concept here is you have a series of boxes that have been provisioned, and then you decide to start building something. So you get your code base, and you might have a pipeline that, depending on the language, you might compile or you might uh, simply grab your files and that will be your application. So what do you do with that? You need to prepare that environment. So you're gonna go through a process of configuration to make sure that environment is ready to receive the application. You're gonna th go through another process of deploying it where you will move uh, your application artifact or artifacts into that environment. And finally, you're gonna go through a series of validation steps which can be unit tests, integration tests, or just manual smoke test. And then when you're happy, you move on to the next environment. And normally, things repeat themselves. You will go through the same steps again of configuring, deploying, and, and validating. And if everything goes okay, you move to the next one. So this might happen a few times. The, 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 the key concept to take out of this is that the closer you are to the code, the more frequently those steps are exercised. So in test, people will configure, deploy, and validate quite frequently, a little bit less in UAT, and then in production, very rarely, only when things are ready to be pushed into production. And again, configuration and deployment is typically uh, a manual task. 
So it's not uncommon after you do that to notice that simply things did not work as expected. And it turns out that deployments to production are a major event. You have to have everybody together over a weekend to make sure that everything went okay. All right, so what typically happens here is we'll go into an organization or a company that says, we want to get started on the part to continuous delivery. And what we usually ask them is, okay, show us your part to production. And we do this for a couple of reasons. One is to get a sense of understanding of what exactly are the problems between development and production. And also because we want to make this visible so the organization can measure and track how effective they're being at shipping code right from a developer workstation into production. And when we do this, one of the first problems we run into, one of the first impediments we run into is the concept that we call accidental inconsistency. It's very common that as you go across environments, you will have some things that need to be different. A, a simple example is a database. In your test environment, you may point to a test database, in your UAT environment, a different database, in production, your production database. And this is something that necessarily needs to be different across each environment so that the environment can perform its role. But that's necessary inconsistency. The best way to explain accidental inconsistency is via an example, I think. Most of us have had this scenario where a dev team has prepared a release in a test environment. They're all excited about it. It's configured. It works. And they're like, let's show this to our business stakeholders. And they try and drop it into the UAT environment. And then suddenly it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, what happened here? We checked our run sheets. We looked at our configuration. Everything is correct. And then someone realizes, oh, we forgot to install this package or we left something lying around in there from the last deployment that we did that messed up with you know, this new de deployment. And in reality, that's what we call accidental inconsistency. What we find is that as you have more and more environments and more and more complex environments, accidental inconsistency is far greater than necessary. And that's really the thing that slows down migration across environments. Because it's really based on human error, it's really, really hard to find and you only know it when you encounter it. And by then, it's too late. You've already wasted so much time trying to fix it. The other thing that happens when we go into companies and we say, OK, you're going to get started on the part to, to continuous delivery. We're going to need a new environment to test this out. Or we're going to introduce a couple more testing stages. And they say, oh, wait a minute. You need a new environment. That's going to take months. And this is such a common story. Environment provisioning is effectively a project that involves collaboration between seven or eight different you know, silos within the organization. And just getting that up and running is a huge, huge problem. It wastes so much time for the teams and it wastes so much time for the organization as they're trying to introduce change. The third and um, really quite interesting impediment that we find in most organizations is what we call the snowflake environment. It's, traditionally, it's quite usually prod, but it can happen anywhere along your path to production. What we mean by a snowflake environment is that one special box or environment that was set up years ago, and nobody knows how to fix it, or nobody knows how to configure it, and everybody is scared to touch it. Only the ops people know how to do it, and they're very, very jealously guarding it because they don't know what you're going to break, and if it does break, no one knows how to get it back up. The documents are gone, or the people who originally set it up are gone. And, and that's a real barrier to having a smooth flow of artifacts or a smooth flow of deployments all across the system. So to summarize, there are many, many impediments that you will encounter as you take your organization or your team on the path to continuous delivery. What we're going to focus on in this presentation are the three that we find most common. Accidental inconsistency, the high turnaround times for an environment, and the fact that some environments are now special or snowflake and can't be rebuilt. Well, nevertheless, we do believe that we can do something about it. There is a way of overcoming these problems uh, and actually achieving continuous delivery. However, just a word of caution that, yeah, if, if you do have a situation, uh, and uh, I did encounter this in the past, where a client had only the binary code for a particular application, and that's what was running in production. No one really had the source code. 
well, that's going to be tricky. So that is a, a perfect, unique snowflake environment that's really hard to change. So unfortunately, if you're in this situation, most likely you're going to have to, uh, you know, rebuild your entire system. But if you have the source code and or if you're building an application uh, from green green fields, you, you might actually stand a chance to be able to fight these impediments. So let's get started. How, how can we do that? So step one is treating configuration as code. So um, when, when we're mentioning, when we mentioned configuration previously, again, we're talking about all the things that you need to do to put your system in a state that it can effectively run. And treating it as code, we are saying, hey, it's just a parallel that if you're a developer, you have a certain level of hygiene with your code. And then what we're suggesting here is make sure that you treat everything as code, including things that most companies don't even think it's possible, such as uh, database changes. So if your schema is changing, you don't necessarily need to have a dedicated team of DBAs to go through your SQL statements to know what's happening. There are tools that you can use to make sure that you create migrations and everything is done in a consistent uh, and repeatable way. So just bringing back our uh, general diagram. So we're talking about that slice over there that configures uh, environments prior to deploying your application. So during this process, a lot of things might happen and they also might happen across different environments. So not necessarily the same configuration uh, will be applied across environments. And, and that's a tricky thing to do as well when you are trying to treat configuration as code. Um, another key aspect, now bringing back to the cloud a bit, is that quite often people start creating their own environments and they configure uh, a particular virtual machine snapshot or an AMI and then they put all the configuration in there and this, they start to move that around and they don't actually treat it as code. They have the configuration that was done for a particular VM just being replicated all over, all over the place and that's not what we are suggesting. We're really saying you have to treat everything as code, not just copying AMIs. So in this context again, is everything that you need to do to bring the installation of an operating system all the way up to a usable state. So that might include installation of FTP servers that you might need in that environment, databases, uh, packages, patches, anything. So it's, it's, it's a pretty broad range of things that you might need to consider for configuration. Uh, another key uh, aspect when we are talking about treating it as code um, is about versioning. So I remember going into a client where when it was time to push the application into production and it didn't work, it turned out that he was like, no, 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 I forgot to do something. And then he logged into the box, opened up a shell script and started tweaking that shell script. And then I looked at it and was like, okay, where is this shell script? Oh, right here. I said, right, but if other people need to see it, where do they go to see it? Oh, no, 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 this only exists in production. I said, okay, that's fine. And what if you change something and you need to roll back to your previous version? Oh, we don't have that. I said, so it's really not versioned. No, not at all. So that's what we are trying to fight when we say treat it as code. Make sure that it's versioned and you can track who done what. Uh, also, make sure whatever you're doing is declarative. Quite often, shell scripts and uh, changes that you make to your environment, they are done in a way that people really can't read. So there are plenty of tools out there these days, like Chef or Puppet, and if you're on Windows land, you can use PowerShell, that you can write code that is readable, that people can in the future maintain, and it's not just 1,000 lines of shell script. And finally, you want that code that you're writing to be executable. You want to make sure that you can uh, run it successfully across different machines. So it, it's got to be executable in a sense that you can repeat it. So what we are aiming here is to move away from manual configuration and run sheets. So manual configuration will impair you in the sense that no one really knows what happened. The run sheets are trying to uh, solve this problem. So people would write down what they are doing and typically developers will put the commands that ops need to run, which is also really bad 
uh, when, you, when you're trying to bring both groups together because a lot of times ops, they don't really know what the commands that they are running do and that becomes a bit of a problem. So what, one of the key advantages of having your configuration as code is first, it won't be ran manually and second, you don't need people simply keying in commands in production. They should actually be able to read the code and know what it does and it will actually be executed by itself. So suppose that you are already doing something like that in your company, you decided to put Chef uh, or Puppet and you're writing your own scripts, you're trying to make things a bit more controlled. Uh, an anti-pattern that we've found in companies quite often is configuration that's executed for the first time in production. So remember, continuous delivery is about production readiness. If you cannot assess production readiness early in your process, what happens is you're still pretty much in the same place. Doesn't matter if you're using Puppet or Chef or any other tool and you're scripting out those changes, but if the first time you do it is when you go into production, you're still pretty much at the same risk uh, uh, as if you're running a, a manual spread, uh, sorry, a run sheet, because you haven't actually tried that before. All right, so that brings us to step two. So let's say we've got your team or your organization now treating configuration as code. Without step two, which is the automation, there's nothing really to prevent someone from executing the wrong configuration on a box. So that's where automation comes in. Now we're gonna try and take away the manual intervention required to actually execute configuration or even deployment code on a particular box. So the part that we're gonna tackle first is the provisioning of environments. What you wanna make sure is that you have the ability to produce new environments so you can test out your configuration. When companies and teams start doing configuration as code, they quickly run into the problem that it is not easy to test your configuration. Usually these involve operating system level changes and unless you're being very, very diligent about how you roll back your configuration, it's really hard to do this. And what you really want to be able to do is spin up a blank machine, apply your configuration, see if it worked. If it doesn't work, I'm just gonna delete the whole machine, create a new machine, try it again. Effectively, that's a really effective cycle for a development team to try and practice. And that's where the, the recent virtualization that we see in our industry has really played a big role. So it's literally in the last few years that virtualization has come into force. It used to be that you'd have to wait months for someone to go and buy a blade server, install it in a data center somewhere, just to have access to that kind of machines. Today, a reasonably priced laptop sitting with a developer means that he has all the tools available to him to produce three or four virtual machines on demand, scriptable, you know, spin up a machine, tear it back down, spin up another one, snapshot its state. And, and this is a tremendous enabler, not just for an individual in a team, but even for the team as a whole. You can spin up whole environments that they need and even to the business, they can actually now say, well, I've got a new, you know, a new product idea here. I want to spin up a new team with their new environments. It's also an enabler from the sense I can now start thinking about you know, blue-green deployments where I have a production instance, a production environment running. I've got a new bit of code coming through. I'm going to spin up a whole new environment for that, test it out, and when I'm ready, switch over to it. So virtualization has really enabled all of this. But it is not an easy thing to get started in your organization, and neither should you be focusing on it. If you're an organization delivering a really interesting product to the market, you want your entire team focused on that product and not necessarily managing servers or hardware or capacity for 10 virtual machines or 20 virtual machines. And that's really where the cloud shines. They take that responsibility out of your business and say, we are going to provide you on-demand capacity. When you want machines, write an API call or write a bit of code and we'll give you a machine on demand. When you don't want that machine, we'll tear it back down. I'll give you an example to illustrate how this could work. Imagine today that you have a key idea that you want to roll into production and the best way for you to do it is to have two teams working in parallel. So they, they're going to need a, a test environment where they can integrate, they're going to need a, a UAT environment. And so they work really hard, they get everything out the door, they get into production, you have a perfect launch, and now you're going to switch into a bit of a BAU mode or a business as usual mode. And you don't really need all the development infrastructure that you kind of spun up. So you can tear it down. 
and then a, a year later or a month later when you realize, oh, you need to do a new feature or a new version of your product, you can just spin it back up immediately from your source control. And that is really where the cloud and, and configuration as code and automation play a big role. So if you can provision machines on demand, what you really need to be able to do as well is to deploy your application into those environments on demand. One of the key things to remember here as you take your team through this transition is to make sure you're not only automating the deploy of your artifacts or your builds into the boxes, but you're also automating the rollback. You have to be able to press a button and say, new version in environment. You should also be able to press a button and say, give me the old version back. When we start doing this in companies, very quickly we realize the need for a command distribution framework. Effectively, this is allowing a, a group of a few people, maybe two or three system administrators, to actually help manage a whole farm of machines. There's a book called Visible Ops, and one of the things they talk about in there are the characteristics of high-performing organizations. And they, they talk about a server to administrator ratio of 100 servers to one administrator. And you really can't do that without this level of automation. You need to be able to manage all these servers at one time. And that's what we call the command distribution framework. There are two standard approaches that we've been playing with in different organizations. The first one is a well-known me metaphor, is you push artifacts over SSH. So you have a few you know, wrapper tools around the fundamental transport, which is SSH, like Capistrano, Fabric, if you're in the Python world. And they help you distribute your artifacts across. The second one is also very, very interesting. Um, it's, it's the whole message bus principle, wherein you have an agent or an agent service running on every single machine that you manage. And all these machines and, and all these agents listen into a message bus. And when you want to deploy a bunch of artifacts onto a particular machine, effectively what you're doing is putting a message on the bus and saying, hey, all those machines in this environment, go find this artifact from this location and install it. And then the agent picks up that message, does the job it's told to do, and then reports back onto the bus, yes, I succeeded, or no, I failed, and accordingly, you can take the next action. The Marinette Collective from Puppet Labs is a good example of this kind of a message bus-based command distribution framework. So if you are starting along the path for automation, and you are considering configuration as code already, there is an anti pattern you've got to watch out for. And this is something that has bitten us in the past. The last thing you want to end up doing is automating the creation of unique environments all the way to production. You really want your environments to be as similar as possible so that the, the, the scripts that actually do the deployment, the scripts that are actually dropping your artifacts on the box and your provisioning scripts themselves are actually being tested the same way across every single environment and are actually being used the same way across every single environment. The last thing you want to end up with is a set of deployment scripts that only work with production. And the first one they're going to get executed is when they actually try and provision your production environment. So fantastic. You got your configuration as code and you're doing automation. How do we put things together? So this is probably the, the key takeaway of this conversation, which is around building and promoting environments. So what we're suggesting here is basically to change the concept of how you see and use an environment. So in that typical workflow that we've been talking about uh, since we started, environments, they are a fixed, steady thing that stays in the same place over time, and people get applications and configurations and push to it. So it's a steady thing that we just change a little bit of it every time we are doing a change. What we're trying to suggest here is to flip that, that on its head. And instead of creating just the application or changing just the application, we're saying build your whole environment and promote them. This promotion is basically changing the role of that environment. So you will make it UAT, you will make it production. So we're going to see how we can achieve that. Um, when we say environments here in this context, we're talking about all the support applications your application servers, uh, underlying frameworks and libraries that you need to have installed, databases and the data that you use for specific purposes. It's not uncommon to have uh, a data set that you use only for performance testing or uh, production-like data to do UAT. 
So this includes both the data and the databases that you use, and also the validation and audiences that you might use that environment for. Again, as performance testing or UAT or any other type of uh, activity that you're gonna be doing over that environment. So how do we put those two things together? At, previously, we used to have just the code being built. So now we're talking about having your configuration as code. So that's what that scroll is representing. So you manage to write and script out uh, provisioning of machines. So I don't know, you might be using CloudFormation or uh, whatever ways of is spinning your environments and then you have your code as well. So from that configuration, you might be able to provision an environment and then you, you have your box or boxes that you are going to use as test. So notice that now it's not test anymore. You're actually saying that this environment will be used as test now. Once it's provisioned, you will go pretty much through the same process of configuring it, deploying, and validating. So nothing really different uh, from what we were doing before. The key concept here is that provisioning that was outside of the blue box, now it's inside because it is part of your process. And the magic actually happens after you decide to use this uh, environment that you validated. So now you will promote it. You will say, well, I was done with my validations as test and now I want this environment to become UAT. Notice that you no longer have two environments. It's the same environment that actually moves across the pipeline and it's used for a different purpose. So let's say UAT and then you're happy with the validation and it repeats once more. So you will get that same environment and make it production. So notice now that instead of having just a little bit of validation done in each one of the machines, you will start to have the same machine being validated over and over and over until it gets into production. So this effectively makes you production ready because you know since the most initial step of your development process that you're always using the same machine and you're testing the same environment different ways with different people. So chances are that you're most likely going to get it right. And even if you don't get it right, you can start over again. And because you had put your configuration and the changes that you made to it in code, you can more easily identify what went wrong. So you might be thinking, okay, how do we actually do that? One of the key concepts to be able to achieve an environment that moves across uh, your pipeline is that you have to really focus on bringing your configuration down towards a minimum because every touch point that you have in your configuration, uh, just as Nigel mentioned previously, it's a necessary inconsistency. So if you have too many necessary inconsistencies, that might hinder you down. There are ways of overcoming that uh, with the cloud. So you might be able to use uh, virtual private clouds to represent different environments and then you can shift them around depending on what you are doing. Uh, you might be able to use reverse proxies to simply change databases and projects that, uh, sorry, services that your, your system talk to. So there are ways of achieving that, but for you to accomplish that, it always has to be with minimum configuration. So it's that's why it actually starts with your configuration as code, because you need to drive this to a minimum state. Also, that's where the cloud shines as well. For you to be able to achieve an environment that moves around, it's quite important that's easy to change what it does, especially when it gets into production. So most cloud environments these days, they allow you to have either VPCs, uh, virtual private clouds that you can move it around. So one of them can be production. Another one, uh, another way of achieving that is with load balancers. So you might actually have your environment, once it's ready to go into production, you just plug it into your load balancer. Another strategy is to uh, attach it to your autoscaler. So there are several ways that the cloud give you so this can actually happen. In the project that uh, Nigel done together, it was put into the uh, uh, autoscaler. So once the whole environment is deemed successful, 
it will be pushed and placed uh, uh, in the autoscaler, and then you can remove your old uh, production environment and the new one stays there. So this also enables you to do a zero downtime deployment. So, and that's again, that's a, a, an environment that makes building and promoting your environments quite achievable. So for you, one more time, let's recap. Treat your configuration as code, get every single thing that you can think of and try to script it out. Make sure it's version, make sure it's declarative, and make sure it's executable. Focus on automating it. Focus on getting your provisioning, your configuration changes, and your deployments automated. And then get those environments created for a particular purpose and move them around. Don't now think of having boxes that will stay static for their entire life. Now, it, I think another good metaphor to try to uh, have this concept around is around of, uh, a pool of threads, right? When you're talking about database connections, for instance, it will create uh, a thread that will talk to a database. Some of them will die, some of them will go stale, and they will be killed. Another one gets created and gets added to the pool. So it's pretty much the same concept here. Now environments can be treated pretty much as a job. So you can spin them, bring them to life, and attach them to the pool to be used for a particular purpose. So we did put together a list of references that we consider useful. Um, the first two are URLs, the top one being the continuous delivery space that we have in thoughtworks.com. So as we mentioned previously, this is the 10th um, webinar in a series of 12, so please do check it out. I know a lot of the concepts around the cloud and continuous delivery we just flew over. Um, so if, if you are unsure of any of the terms or <laughs> what we're talking about, make sure you go back and revisit the other ones. Uh, also, here's Nigel's GitHub project called Configuration Master where this uh, uh, um, strategy that we just mentioned is actually implemented using AWS and Go as a pipeline server. And it does exactly what we described. It creates an environment, runs a series of checks uh, with different purposes, and then attaches it to an autoscaler and also enables you to take whatever old version you have of your environments down and attach the new ones. Also, three books that are always beside, uh, beside our beds, our release it, our continuous delivery from Jess Humble and Dave Farley, and visible ops. I think especially visible ops is something for those that are considering uh, DevOps and are unsure of how to match ITIL and DevOps. It's, it's a very good book to, to get you started on, on doing that. So, to finalize, continuous delivery is fast automated feedback on the production readiness of your applications every time that there is a change, whether it's code, infrastructure, configuration, and database. And the way we're suggesting to achieve this is through building and promoting whole environments using automation that treats every configuration as code.